Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Salo is perhaps most well known for his post World War II era theories related to economic growth. More specifically, he posited that existing neoclassical economic models, although useful in gesturing at how industrialization can stimulate measurable types of growth in a region, don't capture all the variables relevant to that growth. What was missing, his work indicated, was a measurement of progress and in particular, technological progress. So according to this and adjacent economic models, there are two key ways to increase the overall productivity of an individual worker. The first is through industrialization, which roughly correlates with upgrading the infrastructure available within a workplace. The tools the workers use and the systems that determine how they do their jobs primarily. For instance, if you're working at a factory, that makes textiles, and you can produce one set of linens by hand each week. But by upgrading your tools so that you have access to a large, complex loom, you're able to produce a dozen set of linens each week. That upgraded machinery, that new infrastructure, has resulted in 12 times the productivity and thus 12 times the previous level of economic benefit from the same effort exerted. Each worker becoming 12 times as productive will likely mean the prices on the linens being produced can be reduced, and ostensibly at least, the quality of the goods being produced might also go up. Being able to automate aspects of linen producing means that the companies benefiting from that labor-related savings and increase in productivity can then invest in higher quality materials or can produce higher density fabrics. This concept applies to all fields, including those that offer services instead of goods. So investments in these sorts of technologies, technologies that are typically already available but not widely disseminated, often because of cost, but also at times because of a fear of the unknown and untested, or because of a favoritism for traditional methods of doing things, it makes investments in them a pretty good bet as more implementation of existing upgrades of this kind often leads to more productivity per worker, and that leads to overall economic gains throughout a society. The second method of achieving these sorts of gains, though, and this was Salau's innovation, alongside another economist named Trevor Swan, who independently came up with a nearly identical economic model in 1956, the second method is predicated on the realization that although the wider implementation of existing technologies to increase the value produced by each laborer is important, so too is the development of those new technologies which are eventually adopted in this way in the first place. And the measurement of expected output gains from the development of new technologies can be roughly accounted for, which gives us a value for what we might call innovation or technological progress. The salau swan model of measuring economic growth is a means of measuring the economic benefits of that type of progress, and this model is pro-cyclical in that it accounts for changes in variables over time, and non-linear in that the eventual change in worker output is not proportional to the investment which triggers that change. In non-economic speak, that means this model of technological progress influencing economic growth and the amount of value produced by each worker over a given period in particular is something that grows periodically, but not consistently. This growth is not predictable. You cannot invest X dollars in research and development each year and expect to get a consistent Y percentage increase in productivity. You can roughly estimate how much investment will be required to achieve a new innovation that results in some kind of gain, but the amount of gain is not precisely predictable, nor is the amount of time required to achieve it or the quantity of money and other resources invested. New knowledge and invention is something we can count on, in other words, but we can't say for certain when someone will invent something new that's related to the work we're doing nor can we predict when new knowledge will arrive, because much of that knowledge, the stuff that's revolutionary instead of iterative, 
Those are all unknowns until we discover them. And for this type of cycle to be non-linear means that it's possible that you could invest $100 and get $110 worth of value from that investment in research and development. But it's also possible that you could invest $100 and get nothing or $10 million worth of value out the other side. The amount that you put into this kind of exploration is not predictable or connected to the eventual outcome. So this model makes figuring out how much one should invest in R&D based on those unknowns a little more clear because it indicates the right level of money to invest for a decent chance of stumbling upon something great every once in a while, even if it's not a guaranteed thing with any predictable milestones. The upside of the Salau Swan model was that it made clear that innovation was not just desirable, but also necessary if you wanted to achieve consistent growth. And thus, investing in technological development, not just for small iterative jumps, but for massive revolutionary leaps as well, was vital for a company's competitive future. It also gestured at the fact that there would usually be a lag between innovation and adoption. A whiz-bang new type of loom that massively increases the output of linens when installed at a textile factory will take a while to be installed in all the textile factories. So post-innovation, after that new design is released on the market, there will be a period of adoption during which a creeping sort of growth is seen around the world. But that growth is limited by awareness of the new innovation, knowledge of it and why it's valuable, and the adoption costs of both the monetary and cultural variety that are associated with implementing it. At a certain point, though, that creeping growth essentially ceases. All of the factories that are going to get that new design of loom have it, and output per worker in the relevant field plateaus. And that plateau will persist until some new innovation is sparked and begins to spread, repeating that cycle once more. There are quite a few assumptions baked into this model that arguably limit its utility, and that's especially true in the age of digital, byte, and pixel-based products compared to those made out of atoms, old-school, tangible goods. This model was eventually updated to account for, first, a concept called learning by doing, which says that workers tend to increase their levels of productivity naturally over time by coming up with small, practicality-based innovations related to how they do certain types of work. That innovation and application generally taking place at the ground level, rather than it being a top-down process, as is assumed in many economic models. But it was also updated because the Salau Swan model began to fall apart in the late stages of the U.S.-Soviet Union Cold War in the 1980s and 90s. What I'd like to talk about today is how this model has informed many modern conceptions of productivity why some scholars of this subject consider the past few decades to have been a sluggish, relatively unproductive period in historical terms, and why the next few decades might prove, in contrast, to be very productive indeed. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here, consider becoming a supporter. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. Folks who contribute any amount each month receive an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free and call-to-action-free version of the show. A great big thanks to everybody who's already contributing in some way, shape, or form, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to unspool today comes from Axios, and it's entitled... The Coming Tech-Driven Productivity Leap. This piece serves up a nice summary of a concept that's shown up in economics writing in particular 
quite a lot over the past year. And that concept is named after a book written by economist Tyler Cowen in 2011 and is generally mentioned in the context of a raft of recent technological, scientific, and sociological milestones that have been announced since 2015 or so. The book is called The Great Stagnation, with the subtitle, How America Ate All the Low-Hanging Fruit of Modern History, Got Sick, and Will Eventually Feel Better. Now, if you think that title makes this book sound a bit like a highly opinionated pamphlet that probably reads like a very long blog post, you're not wrong. The book is only 60 pages or so, but it's filled with data points and polemic perched atop those data points. And it makes, in my opinion, a fairly solid, if arguably incomplete, argument about the history of innovation and what role innovation plays in the economy. The dominant thesis of the Great Stagnation is this. The world's wealthy countries, but perhaps most overtly the United States, have been coasting on what amounts to low-hanging fruit when it comes to growth and progress for the better part of 300 years. Since the 1970s, though, we've found ourselves attempting to continue operating in that tradition, but with substantially less low-hanging fruit available to be plucked. This low-hanging fruit, by Cowan's estimation, has included the utilization and exploitation of free land, including land that was stolen from one group or another, but also land that has been just sitting there, used by nature but not cultivated, for more efficient, human-centric purposes. The massive benefits gleaned from technological breakthroughs like the harnessing of electricity, the advent of mass communication and transportation, the introduction of sanitation measures like indoor plumbing and modern cleaning and disinfecting products, and the introduction of refrigeration and other climate control-related technologies. This argument has grown to encompass other aspects of progress as well, and some thinkers in this space have since added their own metaphorical fruit to the list. Some consider the exploitation of fossil fuels to be low-hanging fruit, for instance, while others consider the elevation of traditionally excluded groups of people, like women, racial and ethnic minorities, and the like, providing education and social status where these things were previously denied, to be a form of low-hanging fruit that we've been slowly but surely taking advantage of over the past several decades. Within the context of that argument, then, these are human resources that long could have benefited society in many ways, just sitting there because of tradition and prejudice. And these people thus have been over time added to the larger collection of overall human-derived value that aggregates into a society's physical and cultural wealth. Whatever the specifics, though, the key argument is that we've been coasting on the back of these easy-to-access resources for a while now, plucking fruit that doesn't require cooking or much effort to acquire, and then congratulating ourselves on being incredibly talented metaphorical hunter-gatherers and chefs, all because we've never gone metaphorically hungry, essentially misunderstanding our good fortune to be the consequence of skill and capability rather than mostly luck. These gains, though, according to this model, are drying up, and in fact have been providing us with diminishing returns since sometime around the 1970s. The timing varies depending on where you look in the world, with the 1970s being the favored decade for the U.S., while low-hanging fruit is still being plucked by nations like China, that fruit helping them achieve their impressively rapid growth over the past handful of decades, while other developing countries are likely to be able to keep benefiting from this easy access fruit for many years to come, because they've yet to exploit what's already there in the same way that today's wealthiest countries have. That exploitation, by the way, is generally considered to be a positive process, despite the term used for it. It means, for instance, educating people rather than letting them remain ignorant, which provides us with gains as individuals but also as countries and as a global population. That is low-hanging fruit that grants us all benefits, but then eventually, once we've educated essentially everyone, the fruit is used up and no longer available. We then have to work harder to achieve the same gains in terms of progress in the future, usually via innovation of some kind. 
Similarly, plugging everyone into the electrical grid and providing things like indoor plumbing, sanitation, and climate control technologies are investments that are, at times, incredibly beneficial up front. But then to achieve similar gains in the future, we have to work very, very hard. And it's unlikely that we will see gains of a similar scale again until we develop something of similar caliber in terms of importance as utilizable electricity and modern sanitation, which is quite a tall order. If you think about everything that was enabled by and everything that changed as a consequence of the development of just the core understandings of those two areas of inquiry and their resultant technologies. The thesis here, then, is not that plucking all of this low-hanging fruit has been a bad thing, but rather that we've misunderstood what a lot of our recent developments have been. We've found ourselves with baskets full of fruit and assumed that we had this bounty because we are amazing procurers of food. The argument is that it's great that we've had this food available, but not so great that we've assumed we will continue to have food of the same quality and in the same amount forever. Again, metaphorically, referring to innovation and growth. If our economic models are dependent on ever-present growth and our expectations of the future are the same, we are in for a rude awakening when we realize that this growth is not sustainable based only on the application of existing technologies, essentially continuing to spread those newly developed textile machines around until everyone has them, and then expecting to continue to see that kind of growth even after all of those upgrades have been made. At this point in history, pretty much everyone in the developed world has those fancy new looms installed, and at some point we're going to hit a wall in terms of growth and productivity until we start inventing radically new groundbreaking things of the same scale and potency of those earlier revolutionary innovations. What that Axios article posits is that we may be about to enter a period of exactly that kind of innovation and invention once more, and that such an arrival could be both exciting and unnerving, depending on how we frame it and on how we choose to pursue and perceive it. Much of the writing on this subject of late, though, has been fairly optimistic in tone, if still skeptical that things will go as well as they could go if everything lines up nicely and everyone plays their part. Many of the arguments being made are predicated on the slew of new developments we've seen in the past 10 years or so, but especially in the past two or three years in fundamental areas of research and development. These new developments include the recent introduction of messenger RNA-based vaccines, the change-up in custom computer-on-a-chip architecture, heralded by Apple's new M1 design, the release of the deep learning trained GPT-3 language model, phase 3 trials for a promising malaria vaccine, the remarkably rapid decrease in the price of solar power hardware, the potential for new, far more efficient and safe battery designs, the slew of new fusion power plant designs that are being posited, tested, and built, the myriad advances in space exploration and practical knowledge that we've seen coming from government-affiliated groups and private companies, the potential for so-called cancer vaccines, which are really just super-effective treatments based on vaccine technology, but still, and the possibilities we're seeing in new techniques being developed for CRISPR-based gene-editing tools. We've seen artificial intelligence-focused protein-folding milestones. We've seen quantum computing leaps from companies like Google and from government-linked groups in China. There's been massive new investment in electric car technologies, systems, and companies, and an astounding, if mostly invisible to most of us, outlay in cloud computing infrastructure that has moved and continues to move an increasing amount of processing and other tasks from relatively weak and inefficient devices to remote, highly optimized hardware. We are crunching numbers, building cool stuff, empowering normal everyday people with astounding new capabilities, seemingly every day, and behind the scenes there's a steady cadence of new material science developments, big data-related innovations and discoveries, and an increasingly interconnected mesh of devices, people, entities, and resources cross-pollinating 
causing frictions and setting fires, and generally upending even the most well-tended and sturdy-seeming apple carts. These developments are not universally good, nor are they universally bad, but they are, arguably, developments that could bear far more potent fruit in the future. Some of these developments, or innovations that emerge as a result of them, built atop them, could be the next electricity, the next soap, the next refrigeration. And that's what's interesting and exciting about this moment. After a period of measurably less dramatic innovation, except for the internet, according to the thinking of most economists who are writing about this subject at the moment, including the author of that book. But after that dry period, we are seeing a surge in very promising innovations, all of which could sputter out and be nothing. They could be interesting, but not paradigm-shifting. But they could also, if we are lucky, be the kind of change agents that lead to the next big whatever upending the fundamentals and making things better in ways that we by definition have trouble imagining from our current chronological perspective. Much of this framing, I should note, is based on a productivity metric called Total Factor Productivity, or TFP. You can think of TFP as a more modern version of its ancestor, the Salo Swan model that I mentioned in the intro. It's a means of comparing how much output you get from a given set of inputs within an economy. And that very roughly means dividing the output, the amount of value produced, by the average labor and capital inputs used to generate that value. So an economy that generates a certain amount of wealth would divide that wealth by the number of workers involved, how much labor those workers perform, and how much capital, monetary and asset-based resources like forklifts, warehouses, and textile looms, how much of that type of capital is used by those workers to make things, to generate value. Over time, you can show growth in a nation's TFP by essentially tracking how much more value is produced by each unit of input. So it allows us to track the value production over time based on investments and infrastructure and monetary distribution mechanisms, like loans and other sorts of debt, but also in terms of how productive each worker is based on the systems they use, the tools to which they have access, and over longer periods of time, based on new innovations within their field or, more broadly, across society. The core argument here, then, is that TFP growth dropped dramatically in the United States in the 1970s, and even though a lot has happened in terms of technological development since then, those happenings have not had the same potency and reverberance as electricity, refrigeration, indoor plumbing, and so on. If you look back at history, though, many of those more fundamental developments occurred after some kind of forcing function, some change to society, the economy, or the behavior of individuals, directly or indirectly leading to the advent of foundational new technologies or other sorts of innovation. Those new technologies or other innovations then set the tone for a period of adoption, over the course of which we figured out how best to apply those new things, and in many cases found more optimal uses for them than we initially thought possible. In recent history, the early internet could be viewed as an interesting but not particularly groundbreaking innovation that years later would come to change just about everything, including social mores, business norms, the way governments are structured, Looking further back, electricity was initially seen as a cute curiosity, primarily useful for its novelty and capacity to impress one's friends with neat little party tricks. It then became a truly useful thing when it proved up to the task of replacing expensive candles and other sorts of lighting, before then demonstrating even more use cases after electrical grids were built and became more widely available. And even that stage was a few hundred years after what we might call modern electrical devices were consistently built and fiddled around with by inventors around the world. And it was many decades before we would come to recognize electricity's potential to more or less power an industrialized society from top to bottom, making it a near-vital utility. There are many potential forcing functions influencing society today, from the confluence of online factors dramatically reshaping society and economics, 
to the economic and biological consequences of globalization, including, arguably the most dramatic contemporary example of the latter, the speedy and devastating spread of the COVID-19 coronavirus around the world. That pandemic has arguably become its own forcing function, requiring very rapid shifts in everything from education to the way we buy groceries to the automobile industry, which has been forced to move a huge chunk of its business activity online. It's being reported that many businesses, including those in the automobile industry, are planning to change things up permanently after the pandemic has passed, in some cases meaning a full-on work-from-home forever situation or some kind of hybrid model that allows employees to work from home or from wherever they like, at least part of the time. In other cases, it means doing more selling on the internet or fully shifting some previously real-world marketing activities to the world of pixels instead. The benefits in terms of productivity and in terms of savings for some of these companies have turned out to be significant enough that making this accidental experiment permanent has come to seem prudent. And not just when everything is locked down and everyone's potentially contagious. These sorts of forced experiments are often the consequence of forcing functions like natural disasters, wars, and plagues. Some forcing functions also arise from economic disasters like recessions and depressions, while others still rise up out of the ashes of a fallen institution or even a crumbling state. Forcing functions are not a universal requirement of innovation, but there are sufficient historical associations that we can feel fairly confident that changes to the status quo, an upending of expectations, norms, and rituals, can lead to such outcomes even if it takes a while for them to arrive post-upending. And this is true despite the fact that such disasters are often devastating, horrific, and just incredibly sad for those who live through them. And unfortunately, these new innovations can at times be the same. A change in paradigm is not always pleasant, not always comfortable, especially for those who are financially or psychologically dependent on some aspect of the way things are, and who are thus hurt by, or psychologically threatened by, an impending, seemingly dramatic tidal wave of change. It'll likely be several years before we can confidently look back at this moment and say with any certainty whether the changes we're experiencing right now are birthing foundational, ultimately positive, shifts, or whether the good stuff is relatively meager in impact and or made up of mostly flash-in-the-pan spectacles, rather than anything long-lasting and broadly influential. There's also the possibility that this framing of historical patterns is too heavily biased toward economic considerations and is thus missing important root elements that actually tie everything together. A lack of perspective dooming what otherwise seems to be a fairly clean-cut cause-and-effect-like relationship. It does seem likely, even if that grander schema is incorrect, though, that the post-pandemic world will be altered, with a lot of slow-moving trends finally arriving all at once, faster than they would have otherwise, while other potential tweaks that may have been doomed to a permanent purgatory as a result of lowercase c conservatism or nostalgia-powered foot-dragging have instead been forced into practice with countless consequences, some of which will likely serve us better than what came before, while others will seem like a shadow of what we previously took for granted, but then lost during this transitionary period. I personally like this framing of things because it seems very optimistic, but it's an optimism couched in a type of rationality, which is my preferred type of optimism. That said, every prediction of this kind has blind spots, suffers from incomplete and or misread data, and has at times, throughout history, led us astray. So while this model is worth keeping in mind and available as one way of looking at what's happening in the world right now, it's also prudent to avoid perceiving it as anything even approaching gospel truth. Mm -hmm.
enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. There are multiple ways to do that. You can find both monetary and non-monetary options at letsknowthings.com support. But the simplest way is probably to become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. Folks who contribute any amount each month receive an additional episode of the show each month and an ad and call-to-action-free version of the show. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance, if you're considering doing so in the future. The book that I'd like to recommend today is a collection of short stories called Sum, S-U-M, 40 Tales from the Afterlives, by David Eagleman. This is a relatively short book even as short story collections go. And that's because despite the fact that there are 40 stories in this book, most of them are quite short, just a couple of pages long. And each of them is a different description of a different afterlife or a different organizational method for the way reality and death and the afterlife work. And it's the type of concept that gripped me immediately. I love these sorts of conceptual short story collections. But even within the realm of a genre type that I already like, this one stood out as a very good example. The stories are very well written. The author clearly knows what he's talking about. When it comes to scientific concepts, on top of having a fairly remarkable imagination to come up with all of these different afterlife concepts... And I found myself just breezing through it as well. I think I read it all in one setting and truly enjoyed every moment of it. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Some 40 Tales from the Afterlives by David Eagleman. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other podcast, Brain Lenses, wherever you get your podcasts or at brainlenses.com. You can find my daily news curation newsletter at yesterdaysnewsletter.com. And you can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.